my name is Mark Vetter, and um, I'm also one of the Clinical Anatomy Research Fellows here at the Seattle Science Foundation. And I'm going to be presenting on a recently published paper. Um, it's a literature review regarding a condition known as winged scapula. And this will be a comprehensive review of the surgical treatment, both historical and contemporary, that are used to manage this condition. So let's talk a little bit about clinical presentation, the etiology and pathogenesis for um, winged scapula. So usually the clinical presentation of winged scapula is when the vertebral or the inferior, the vertebral border or the inferior angle of the scapula displays unusual prominence. And we can break down scapular winging into sort of two main subcategories. We have lateral winging or medial winging of the scapula. And both of these um, involve sort of different um, neurological symptoms um, and neurological etiologies. So one of the main symptoms of winged scapula is a limited range of motion and a um, limited strength in the shoulder joint, um, specifically limited ability to um, abduct the arm forward. And it can also lead to significant discomfort and pain for certain patients in aggravated situations. And lastly, and importantly, it can lead to very significant cosmetic deformity for patients, which um, patients can find tough to deal with um, in everyday life. So let's talk about a little bit, first of all, medial scapular winging um, and the etiology behind it. It is by far the most common um, presentation of scapular winging, and um, it usually arises secondary to long thoracic nerve lesions. So the long thoracic nerve arises from the brachial plexus, specifically roots C5, C6, um, and C7, and it passes between the anterior and mid uh, middle scalene muscles and um, descends sort of on the lateral side of the body to innervate the serratus anterior. And so when the long thoracic nerve is damaged, um, usually this ends up um, presenting itself as serratus anterior palsy, and the serratus anterior um, muscle helps sort of with forward um, and inferior rotation of the scapula when the arm is adducted. So what happens with serratus anterior palsy is <clears throat> the scapula then um, kind of shifts superiorly and medially, um, as you can see in that picture C, um, and how it looks like on patients is um, that image just to the left of it. And so now lateral scapular winging, as I mentioned earlier, it's by far the less common sort of presentation of scapular winging um, and has a completely different etiology. So usually lateral scapular winging is associated with spinal accessory nerve lesions. So the spinal accessory nerve is the 11th cranial nerve um, and it descends to innervate both the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid muscles. And so when this nerve is damaged, um, it usually can lead to trapezius palsy. And so the trapezius helps the scapula by um, uh, enabling sort of upward and um, slightly medial motion of the scapula when the arm is abducted. So when the trapezius um, no longer functions, we see more of a lateral winging where the scapula shifts um, laterally um, with forward shoulder movement. All right, let's talk just really briefly about the pathogenesis. So um, I broadly broke this down into non-surgical as well as iatrogenic sort of pathogenesis. Um, and so in terms of non-surgical, um, usually we'll see non-surgical causes for scapular winging, especially with medial scapular winging, um, so damage to the long thoracic nerve. And there's a whole variety of um, issues that can cause um, long thoracic nerve damage. So you can have compressive injury, blunt trauma, repetitive action. A lot of times um, we'll see weightlifters sometimes get um, some sort of long thoracic or spinal accessory um, nerve damage. So a um, very broad spectrum of conditions or events can lead to um, medial scapular winging. Um, so for in terms of iatrogenic damage, usually we see most of the lateral scapular winging um, cases caused by some sort of surgical damage. So since it has to do with the spinal accessory nerve, a lot of times the procedures that cause lateral scapular winging have to do with um, procedures in the posterior cervical triangle, so tumor dissections in the neck, lymph node biopsies. So those are some of the um, procedures that can um, put the uh, spinal accessory nerve at risk. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the surgical treatment, which was the um, purpose of this paper. So for the purpose of this presentation, I kind of broke it down into four major categories. Some of these are more antiquated, um, moving up to um, sort of modern approaches to surgical treatment of uh, winged scapula. <clears throat> we have static tendon and fascia transfers dynamic tendon transfers, which are still very commonly used, arthrodesis and scapulopexy, which is kind of a secondary measure um, used to deal with scapular winging, and microneurolysis or nerve transfer. And these are kind of more modern, um, the neurological sort of approaches to treating um, winged scapula 
And um, as we'll talk about, there's uh, more of a need for research in those areas still. So um, the first sort of documentation of um, wing scapula being treated surgically um, is documented by Dr. Alfred Tubby in 1904, British orthopedic surgeon. Um, and so <laughs> his, um, his, um, his, his patient or the patient he documented was suffering from serratus anterior palsy and therefore had medial scapular winging. And so what um, Dr. Tubby did was um, he took the, <laughs> he split uh, he split the sternal head of the pectoralis major from the rest of the muscle um, and moved it posteriorly and sutured it to the serratus anterior at its point of insertion into the scapula. So um, this was done to sort of recreate or mimic the um, function of the serratus anterior, which was damaged. Um, there were some issues with these kind of static tendon transfers. Um, one of them was that oftentimes the um, fascial sling or the um, tendons used to anchor uh, that were anchored um, into the muscles on the scapula were, uh, would suffer from atrophy over time. And so you'd see patients who would have this sort of re recurrent winging after um, a few years. So these procedures evolved into very commonly used procedures today, um, kind of generally classified as dynamic tendon transfers. And so one procedure that's still kind of the standard approach to treating medial scapular winging is called direct pectoralis major transfer. It's slightly similar to the procedure Dr. Tubby used um, but it, uh, in this particular case, the pectoralis major, the sternal head, is directly um, sutured onto the um, inferior uh, point of the scapula. Um, and it's quite an effective procedure. In one particular clinical feasibility study, 11 out of 15 people who um, underwent this procedure reported improvement of symptoms. So it is a pretty effective procedure, which is why it's um, standard today for the treatment of medial scapular winging. Secondly, another really common procedure is the Eden Lang procedure, which um, is used more for lateral scapular winging due to, uh, due to trapezius palsy. I'm going to move over one slide where we can see a little bit more what's happening in this procedure. So in this particular procedure, um, the rhomboid muscles are detached um, from the lateral portion of the scapula and advanced and reattached along the infraspinatus fossa um, a little bit more medially. Um, also, the, leva the levator scapulae muscles are detached from the um, superior portion of the scapula and also move more medially and reattached along the spine of the scapula. This is meant to sort of mimic the trapezius muscles' um, motion or um, effect on the scapula. So moving quickly to um, the second sort of broad, a third broad category of treatment, we have um, scapulothoracic arthrodesis and scapulopexy without arthrodesis. And both of these procedures are usually used um, when dynamic tendon transfers fail um, or in patients who suffer from conditions such as muscular dystrophy in which tendon transfers um, wouldn't be very nearly as effective. It's used um, as a sort of secondary measure because it's a much more invasive procedure generally, a little bit more constricting as well. With scapulothoracic arthrodesis, the scapula is actually fused onto the rib cage using the help of a plate as an intermediary and wires. Um, it's really effective, so in one study, 91% of patients who underwent this procedure reported less shoulder pain and more expansive range of motion, but in that same study, over half of patients experienced some sort of complication, a lot of times associated with the hardware used in the procedure, such as the plates, um, which is why there's this alternative procedure, sort of a scapulopexy without arthrodesis, in which the scapula is actually directly fused on the ribcage without the use of a plate, so using a bone graft. Um, so still pretty invasive, but um, it kind of minimizes the hardware involved in the procedure, so you can see some, um, uh, there's less of an opportunity for some certain complications, so. And then lastly, moving into some of the more modern neurosurgical alternatives that have been used to deal with scapular winging. Um, we have one that's a little bit more extensively studied, known as microneurolysis, um, and specifically in the study that I used for this paper, um, we saw that external and internal microneurolysis were used to decompress the long thoracic nerve right about at its um, point of passage between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. Um, and this was used to um, remove some scar tissue and uh, that was there secondary to compression and hopefully restore function to that serratus anterior muscle. So um, this is also a pretty effective procedure. In um, the study that I looked at, 90% of patients who um, underwent uh, this surgery um, and sh uh, talked about some sort of improvement of their scapular winging three days after operation. Um, a little bit more um, 
uh, less well understood procedure in terms of complication rates and success rates is nerve transfer surgery, which use a, utilizes a donor nerve um, to hopefully restore function to, um, for example, in this particular study or uh, presentation, the long thoracic nerve. And so there's um, not too much literature on uh, the use of nerve transfer surgery for uh, scapular winging, but in one particular study, which kind of had a, a limited scope, three out of five patients showed still mild um, scapular winging after undergoing nerve transfer surgery. And um, in, the partic in that particular study, the thoracodorsal nerve, which also emerges from the brachial plexus, was used as the donor nerve. Um, but as I'm saying, one of the conclusions from this review is that nerve transfer surgery and microneurolysis, these kind of neurosurgical alternatives to scapular winging treatment, are still sort of um, areas in which the medical literature can kind of help advance scapular winging treatment, um, especially in the identification of new do uh, donor nerves and which nerves are most practical for re the long thoracic nerve or the spinal accessory nerve. So that's sort of the direction that um, if I had to continue doing this research, I would head. But that's it from me. So thanks for your time. And um, yeah, thanks to everyone who made this presentation possible.